Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. Jeremiah 14 seems somewhat repetitious at first look, but I think there really is something significant here, uh, not only in the uh, our regular way of going through exegetically so that you can have a better feel for the Old Testament. You know, I know this kind of study gets very tedious for many people at times. And I want to reiterate the purpose of this, uh, not only as a verse-by-verse exposition of this book uh, to do a commentary on, but, you know, I think that we are very, very uh, uninformed about the Jewish perspective. And what this does is hopefully give us a feel for the way that the Hebrew people looked at life. I think we really forget that the surprise thing is, uh, remember how when the Jews for Jesus came, they had a little t-shirt called the Goyim for Jesus or Gentiles for Jesus? That's the unusual thing, you know. And we sometimes make Jesus into a white Anglo-Saxon middle-class middle-aged guy, and he's not. He is an Oriental person, a Jewish person. His background is the Old Testament. And the more we can understand of the Scriptures that bathe the heart of our Lord, the better we're going to be able to understand the New Testament. So hopefully as we go through here, and I've mentioned to you about the Jewish morning rite, or we talk about the, what words would have meant to a Jewish person, hopefully... Uh, Week by week, month by month, year by year, you're becoming more and more cultured to see in the world through biblical glasses. And that is a major part of all this. Now, let's begin in verse 1, if we could. I've entitled this chapter in my Bible, Jeremiah the Intercessor. This is in the famous tradition of Abraham praying for Sodom, of Paul praying for the Jewish nation, Here is Jeremiah praying for a people who would not hear his message, would not obey the word of the Lord. Jeremiah knew destruction was coming, and yet he puts his heart in with their heart and beseeches God to have mercy. I think it's a beautiful, beautiful passage. Now, if you'll notice, it's kind of funny. It says, that which came as a word of the Lord. Now, doesn't that sound funny to you? The Bible says, the word of the Lord came to me, saying... Well, the reason that this is a little bit different in English, it's trying to say to you that the Hebrew is a little different. This is a very unusual formula to introduce the words of God. It's a way maybe of saying that that Jeremiah is going to relate to you what God said, but he's going to tell you the general context first. So it's a very unusual kind of phrase. And the whole theological problem here is a famine or a drought. Now... The word drought is plural, and that's not highly unusual in Hebrew because many things are plural in Hebrew that we wouldn't think should be, but it seems to be either an intensification idea, it was a very, very bad drought, or it was a perennial sequence of very short but severe droughts right at the planting time. And uh, whatever it was, it was a very bad situation. Famines are not something new in the Bible. As you know, all of the Hebrew children went down to Egypt because of famine in the land. Uh, When Elijah was on Mount Carmel, that whole experience was over a terrible drought that God had sent to turn the people's heart back to him. And so drought is a common way that God uses to help people come to his will. It was God's will that Jacob and his family be in Egypt. It was God's will that Elijah turned the heart of Israel back to Yahweh only. And it was God's will that this famine come and and that Israel have one more chance to turn back to God. Israel could never say, God never told me. God just never gave me a chance. No, God gave that nation of Judah chance and chance and chance again. So here he is using the physical elements to speak to this nation. Now... Judah mourns, her gates languish. They sit on the ground in mourning, and the cry of Jerusalem has ascended. Now, let's just talk for a minute about biblical metaphors. 
when they, when they talk about the gate, what are they talking about? When they say the gate language, that's a biblical metaphor for something. What, what do you think it is? The cities, the place of justice, cry out. It's either saying that the cities of Judea are, saying, are crying out to God for help, or it's saying the place where they should have had justice but where they had injustice was now crying out to God to do something. Now, the second place, I think King James has something about them sit on the ground in the black or something like that. What does King James have? They are black under the ground. Okay, that, that's a little bit too wooden translation. Um, what that is saying is they have put ashes on their head. They are prostrate in the dust in a sign of national mourning. And they're hoping that by this act of mourning and, obesity and uh, obeisance that they will somehow get God to let, make the drought go away. Um, ashes on the head. Now, this, this, um, <clears throat> this drought is one of the curses that God told them He would bring upon them if they broke the covenant. Remember in Deuteronomy, the, the great... Uh, cursing and blessing place where later on when they crossed the promised land Joshua got down the middle of the valley where Shechem was and the Levites got up on Mount Ebal and Mount Gezerim one would sing the blessing one would sing the cursing well this is part of the cursing if, if the children of Israel didn't keep their part of the bargain this was the results you find it in Deuteronomy 28 verses 23 and 24 um, you want to see a, a, a proof text kind of for this place of the gates being a place of justice you might want to see Deuteronomy 16, 18. In verse 3, it just says that the, the rich people send their servants out for water, and there is no water. There's none. There's no water for people. There's no water for cattle. There's no water for wild animals. There is nothing. It is really bad. No dew is even falling in the mornings. Okay? Now, look in verse 4. The ground is cracked. Okay? That's the idea, and you know what that's talking about. The farmers have been put to shame. The last part of verse 4. Now, the reason the farmer put to shame is with those crude wooden plows, the only time you could break that hard ground is after it rained. And so the farmer in the latter rains, the farmers depended on. The, the, the first rain softened the ground so they could plow. The second rains came in time to help the, the plants to grow for the harvest. If the farmers can't even break ground, there's no hope of harvest whatsoever. I think maybe some of you out here know how hard ground can get when it's dry. It's almost like cement. It gets so hard. So these farmers can't even plow. There's no hope of harvest. They're starving to death, and there's no hope in the future because the rains have not come. Now, in verse 5 is a metaphor from nature, but I think it'll touch your heart because uh, I, I love to deer hunt. But I want to tell you, I know the love of a deer for their little ones. Those mother does will fight a buzzsaw for that little, that little fawn. We were up hunting in Wyoming, and uh, I was with uh, Anita's daddy, Al, and we, found, we saw a big, oh, about a 1,600-pound female moose with a little bitty cub. And he said, don't get any closer. I heard those things will butt trains if they think they're hurting that calf. <laughs> butt trains, man. That's maternal instinct. Uh, the picture here is of a biblical animal called a hind. We would call it a female doe. She gives birth to her calf, but she leaves the calf there because there's not enough food for her to have milk. She just abandons it. It'll die quick and won't die slow. And uh, that's how bad the droughts come. Even nature, the most strongest ties in nature, are breaking under the pressure of this drought. Now... Verse 6, the wild donkeys stand on the heights. They pant the air like jackals. Now, wild donkeys are kind of like our, uh, our donkeys, but they were wild. They were animals that were adapted to a desert climate. They could survive on almost nothing. They, you know, it didn't take much grass or much uh, moisture for them to survive. And even these animals on the point of death, look where it says their eyes fail them, the last part of verse 6. Now, these animals are noted for their sharp eyesight. That's how they stay wild. They're standing there. They're so close to death, their eyes have gone. Okay? Now, verse 7. And here is Jeremiah beginning to act as intercessor for the people. 
Although our iniquities testify against us, O Lord, act for thy name's sake. Truly our apostasies have been many, and we have sinned against thee. Jeremiah is trying to collectively confess the sins of Israel by making it our and we. But it won't work. Because I don't think that one can confess the sins of many. Now, there are some biblical examples of that. Remember in Second Chronicles, if my people will call my name, will humble themselves and pray, that is few repenting and God doing the whole. I think in the book of the Revelation, we talked about the seven churches. God was calling on those who saw the problem to repent, and God would heal the church. So I think it is not to say that that never happens, that the repentance of few does not affect the many. But here, the repentance of Jeremiah had no effect on the calamity that was coming upon this nation. When it says in the middle of verse 7, for thy act for thy name's sake, you might well see verse 21, where I think that's so important. Uh, it mentions it again. And then a classical passage that I'm really thinking about preaching on Sunday is Ezekiel 36, 22 and 23, where God says, I'm not going to do it for you, Israel. I'm going to do it because my name's involved. And that's what Jeremiah is trying to say. He's saying, look, God, everybody knows that you're the God of Israel. If Israel gets taken in captivity and they all starve to death and drought, they're going to say you are not the kind of God you claim to be. Now, this was kind of a, an underhanded argument to use for God. What it was saying is, God, you need to do for us because you promised. But that was the whole problem of this nation. They thought that when times got bad, they could run back to God and say, God promised us He will do it, and forgot that God's promises were linked to the covenant response on the part of the people. God has never given man a blank check of grace. He has given him grace and then given him responsibilities. We need to think about that. Now, notice where it mentions here... Um, in verse 8, two unusual titles for God. Hope, Savior, in my translation, they're both capitalized. And I think that's uh, talking about physical deliverance. Remember that the Old Testament word for salvation has, does not have the connotation of spiritual salvation as the New Testament does, but it means physical deliverance for the most part. And when you read the Psalms, I think you can see that very clearly. Notice where it, it uh, talks about God, and he's... Jeremiah is trying to prime the spiritual pump. He's saying, you're the hope of Israel. You're the Savior uh, in times of distress. But you're acting funny. Now, I want you to know that Jeremiah must have had and felt very close to God to be able to say what he's about to say. In his supplication prayer, he's saying, God, you're acting funny. And this is how I think you're acting. Number one, you're acting like a stranger in the land or like a traveler who has pitched his tent for the night or like a man who is dismayed or confused, like a soldier who can't save. Look what he's saying. He's saying, you promised to do some things, and you're not doing them. Now, what's the deal? And then he comes back to say, Yet thou art in our midst, O Lord, and we are called by thy name. Do not forsake us. Wow. What a tragic picture. Now, I want to... Um, I want to mention to you what I think is so significant here, and I want you to think about it. <clears throat> a few years earlier, um, Assyria, Shennacherib, had come to the gates of Jerusalem, and God had defeated that large Assyrian army by striking them blind. Remember that account? And Jerusalem was totally delivered by the word of Isaiah in Hezekiah's day. Now, those were promises, and Isaiah said, They will not take this city. Trust God. He will deliver you from this army. And now we're a, we're a few years down the line, and here comes the prophet Jeremiah. And Jeremiah says, You're going into captivity. The people say, No. God has promised that this city is sacred. God would never let this city fall. Now, I think what's happened is this. Those people were trusting in the promises that Isaiah made to the people of his day. They were trying to use his preaching to apply to this situation. What they were doing, they were proof-texting the Old Testament. And I'm sure many of these false prophets were saying, I'm preaching the same thing Jeremiah, I mean, Isaiah preached in his day. 
I'm just following Isaiah's theology. God's going to protect this city. You see, rabbinical Judaism in, in Old Testament thought that Israel, and especially Jerusalem, was God's people, God's place. He, God dwelt symbolically above that Ark of the Covenant in the temple. God wouldn't let His temple be destroyed. Isaiah d said He wouldn't, and He didn't. But you see, they had forgotten that Isaiah linked repentance and faith to God sparing that city, and the people did. Now, here they are saying, oh, all we've got to do is offer enough sacrifices and do, go through enough ritual, and God's, God's Word doesn't lie. God said it. That settles it. This city will not be taken. No, my friend, it does not settle it. The attitude and response of man's heart is often the condition for the promises of God. I believe all men are potentially saved in Jesus Christ, but man has to respond to make his death efficacious for their life. God had some promises to Israel if, if they would, he would. If they would not, here is the consequence. The people of God are going into exile. The city of God will be leveled. The temple of God will be raped for all her valuables that are never found again. The Ark of the Covenant will be eliminated from history right here, Nebuchadnezzar. And I think it's a, a real contrast. So what works one time won't work another, and we better make sure that we find the whole scope of God's Word to us and don't tiptoe through the Bible like going through the tulips picking out what we want. You see, all these prophets of Jeremiah's day thought they were speaking for God. But they were not. Now, when it mentions here, um, do not forsake us, they want the covenant blessings without the covenant obligations. Isn't that just like us? We want God's blessing, but we don't want to pay the price for it. Now, in verse 10, Thus says the Lord of the people, Even so, they have loved to wander. They have not kept their feet in check. And this is a quote from Hosea chapter 8, verse 13. Uh, therefore, the Lord does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity and call their sins to account. Here's this people on their face in the dust. That's the picture of this idea of being, uh, being mourning. They have ripped their garments. They've put ashes on their head. They're laying in the streets of Jerusalem. And the next verse over here, 12, they are offering sacrifices by a, a, in a huge number. They're offering more sacrifices than ever. And God says it ain't going to work. It ain't going to work. It's gone too far. You feel like that you can manipulate me by doing certain things, but your heart is not right. They were crying, but they didn't really have repentance. Now, notice it says, call their sins to account. Friends, I want you to know it's a biblical principle. We don't like it, but it is as biblical as anything else is. And that is, we will all give an account before the Lord of the deeds that we've done in this body. Believer and non-believer alike, we will stand before the Lord. Now, grace will cover those of us that know the Lord. And we will not be punished for our sins, but we're going to give an account of them. And he's going to say, what's the matter with you? Why didn't you? And it's coming today. This is the people of God we're talking about. And we're called into account for the way they were living and their priorities. So the Lord said to me, Do not pray for the welfare of this people. Now, he said that twice before. 7, 16, 11, 14. God has said, Jeremiah, don't pray anymore like this. Now, theologically, what's that meaning? God doesn't want to hear Jeremiah's prayer? No, it's a, it's a way of saying repentance is impossible. Jeremiah, don't pray because they're not going to respond. Jeremiah, I can't respond until they respond because I have a covenant with obligation with them, but they've broken it. I can't fulfill my promises till they turn to me in love and faith, and they're not going to do it, so don't pray anymore, Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah can't stand that, and he keeps right on praying, <laughs> but God tells him not to. Now, in verse 12, I think it's very important for this, and I, I want to uh, set the stage if I could. The tragedy of verse 12 is that men begin to think that the things that they do make them right with God. Men begin to think that doing religious things is all that it takes 
to be right with God. Men get so caught up in the ritual of religion, they forget that primarily biblical faith is a personal relationship and not doing things. Now look at verse 12. God had told them to do all these things. When they fast, now special fasts were not uncommon to rid the country of drought or solve a national problem. They were not eating religiously, okay? I am not going to listen to their cry. The word cry here is the word wail, shriek, okay? When they offer burnt offerings and grain offerings, I'm not going to accept them. Rather, I'm going to make an end of them by the sword, famine, and pestilence. God told them to sacrifice to expiate their sins. But you see, if you'll read Deuteronomy, it was never the act of sacrifice that was the supreme uh, want. It was the heart of the offerer. It was the attitude. It was the motivation of the sacrifice. You can do all kinds of Christian things. But if your heart is not right with the Lord, it doesn't mean anything. There are too many people doing religious things that don't have a repentant, faithful relationship with God through Christ. Ritual will not save you. Only a personal relationship will. And once the relationship is in place, the ritual becomes very meaningful. Now, the sword, the famine, the pestilence, those triads of destruction are used a number of times through here. Those are the means that God uses. Natural means, foreign nations. Now, verse 13, new paragraph. But all, Lord God, I said, look at the prophets. They are telling them, you will not see the sword, nor will you have famine, but you will give you a lasting peace in this place. Now, these guys may have been followers of Isaiah. They may have been very sincere, but they had missed the word of God for their word. What they were saying is what they wanted. What they were repeating is what their heart thought up, not what God revealed to them. Now, this is the same message Isaiah had, but it's a different time and a different place. Now, notice here where it says... I, here's Jeremiah's thought. He's saying, look, the people need help. They're, they're offering all these sacrifices, God, but it's not. It, you don't seem to be responding to this. God says, no, their, their attitude's wrong. Jeremiah says, yeah, but it's not their fault, God. Their religious leaders have told them these lies. They're not really responsible, God. Uh, it, the priest and the prophets have told them the wrong things. Now, that's the argument Jeremiah's trying to use. First, Jeremiah tried to say, do it because of your namesake. And God said, no. They're, this covenant goes two ways. And they've let their bar, end of the bargain down. No, I won't do it because of my namesake. His second argument is, well, they've been, they've been taught. They went to the wrong seminary. They got the wrong kind of theology. It's not their fault. Not their fault. And God answers that question too. Then the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying falsehood in my name. I have neither sent them, nor commanded them, nor spoken to them. They are prophesying to you a false vision, divination, futility, and the deception of their own minds. Now, here's what he's saying. The people should have been able to know a false prophet from a true prophet. And one good reason is what the prophet says. Now, during this time in Israel... Fertility cults were all over the place. The prophets of Baal had intermixed with the prophets of Yahweh. And right then, the people should have known this is the wrong way to go. Deuteronomy 13, uh, 1 through 5, Deuteronomy 18, 22, all of these talk about how do you know a true prophet. If what he says comes true, he's a true prophet. If what he says doesn't come true, he's a false prophet. And then 18, 22 says, if he tries to lead you after any other god, he's a false prophet. When those prophets use divination, you see it there in verse 14? That should have been, all, that's like me getting a crystal ball up here and telling you what's going to happen. Man, those folks knew that wasn't a, a true prophet. Deuteronomy 18.10 rails against divination. And here the prophets of God are doing this. The people should have known. Now, New Testament speaking, there is a special gift of the discernment of spirits. But there is an individual gift 
in you from the Holy Spirit that allows you to know great error from the truth. And you need to function that because I want to tell you the, the greatest heretics I know are alive today. Very subtle, but are alive. Now, if you want to see what God does for prophets, just reverse what he said he didn't do in verse 14. You'll get what he does do to true prophets. Uh, verse 15, Therefore says the Lord concerning the prophets who are prophesying in my name, although it was not I who sent them, yet they keep saying, There is no sword, no famine in the land. By the sword and the famine, those prophets will meet their end. What? <laughs> I'll put it colloquially. God says, By their spiritual gun, their spiritual gun, I'll kill them with. They keep preaching this won't happen, that won't happen. That's the very thing I'm going to bring on them. Irony. Now, you can, the rest is, uh, you, let me start at verse 16. There will be no one to bury them. That's the height of shame to a Hebrew person. Not because of any views of the afterlife, but just the a exposed body polluted the whole land. That's horrendous to a Jew. Now, uh, notice down in verse 18 where it says, if I go to the country, behold, they are slain with the sword. If I enter the city, behold, disease and famine. It's a beautiful, beautiful. This is an accurate picture of a siege. The army is outside the gate. They've got everybody pinned up in a little place. The water gets polluted. Disease becomes rampant. So outside they're killed by the sword. Inside they're killed by pestilence, disease, and famine. What a picture for the people of God. What a judgment. What a calamity. What a theological horror for these people to have to go through. And yet... I think it was God's grace that said, if you're trusting in the sacrifices, I'll have to take the sacrifices away from you. If you're trusting in the Ark of the Covenant, I'll have to take the Ark of the Covenant away from you. Because what I want you to do is trust in me, not in things. People are so bad about making things gods. Even that snake that Moses lifted up in the wilderness to keep them from having to die from those snake bites, later on had to be destroyed because the people made it an idol to be worshipped. I want to tell you, many people who make the Bible an idol, do you know that? This book can become an idol when it becomes the focus and center and goal of your faith. Our faith is not goal-oriented in a book. It's goal-oriented in a person. A book is simply a means to a personal relationship. To make this book the ultimate is a disgrace to the person of Jesus Christ. To make a denomination ultimate to make a building ultimate, to make certain words ultimate, are prime examples of man's idolatry in the area of religion. Continues in verse 19. I think 18 is talking about the exile. In verse 19, Thou hast completely rejected Judah, question, or hast thou loathed Zion? Why hast thou stricken us so that we are beyond healing? We waited for peace, but nothing came. And a time of healing, but behold, terror. This is what Rashi, the Jewish commentator, says about this verse. This is the way he paraphrases it. If you have not completely rejected them, then do not punish them so much that they cannot be cured. This was the people of God. Friends, they were shouting the promises to David. They were saying, God, you promised there'll always be a king on the throne. God, you promised your spirit would always dwell in this place. God, even Isaiah, just a few years ago, you prophesied through him that no one would take this city. You see, they were sincere, but they had sincerely misfocused biblical faith. And the only thing God can do when biblical faith is misfocused is to eradicate. That's why the exile had to happen in Israel's history. It had to teach her several things. Number one, that the temple is not automatically the ultimate. God is the ultimate. That's a hard lesson to learn because that temple had become it. Finally, they had to realize that they could function out of the promised land. God was not a local geographical deity. And they had to learn you can't mix the worship of God with other gods. All of those things were learned at the price. And I want you to think for a minute. What if all of a sudden in this country, every church was leveled, every Bible was burned, every pastor and his family were killed, 
and all of your children were taken out of your home so you wouldn't corrupt them, what would you think? That would be a mere, not complete, but somewhat example to the theological destruction that happened to these Jewish people when their temple was destroyed and the promises of God were not valid as they saw it and God had let them down and their children were killed in the streets and their old men were killed in the streets and their cities were destroyed completely and they were drugged off in chains and their women were ravished. Now, can you imagine God allowing that to happen and sending the very ones to do it? You see, it's so easy to sit back in a pew and not realize what we're talking about. It was more important for God that the children of that generation turn back to Him in true faith than a, a group just continue to do the ritual of religion. Now, notice in verse 20, We know our wickedness, O Lord, the iniquity of our fathers, for we have sinned against Thee. Now, there's two kinds of wickedness here that I think we need to see. We don't see often. Number one, have you ever thought that there is a collective social guilt that all of us are involved in? There is a guilt of society that you and I have on our heads because we are the only ones that know the truth and we sit in our homes and do nothing about a polluted, perverted, godless society. You say, not America in God we trust. <laughs> Have you driven around Lubbock lately? Have you? Have you seen the poverty in our town? Have you seen the system abusing people? Have you seen a city with so many churches that we have more per capita than anyone in the United States a few years ago? and yet a town that does not live for God? Friends, I want to tell you, we have an element of social guilt on our heads because we have let our society become godless and we have not done a thing. We've tried to pull our righteous skirts around ourselves and say, well, that's their business. No. We will answer to God for the sins of our society. And second, of course, is the very common thing. We have sinned. There's personal guilt involved. Now, look at verse 21. Very unusual. Jeremiah is going to try one more time to get on God's good side by saying, But you're God. <laughs> Do not despise us for thine own namesake. Do not disgrace the throne of thy glory. Now, what's that? Where is that? What is that? The Ark of the Covenant. The Holy of Holies. The Temple. Center of the, the center pillar of the presence of God and His people. Okay? Remember and do not annul thy covenant with us. And what God's saying is, Brother Prophet, I didn't annul nothing. You and your people annulled what's annulled. I've kept every part of my bargain. I've been faithful for hundreds of years of your backslidden, stubborn rebellion. And I've waited and waited and waited, and I've tried everything in the world to get you to turn to me. I've tried famine. I even took your northern ten sister nations captive, but you didn't learn. No, Jeremiah, I'm not going to break the covenant, but you did. And now you'll reap the whirlwind for what you've sown. Verse 22, And there are, are there any among the idols of the nation who will give rain? Or can the heavens grant showers? It is not thou, O Lord our God. Therefore we hope in thee, for thou art the one who has done all these things. Notice, subtle, subtle here, but very, very important. Who had the Judeans been bowing down to for fertility? Who had they been on the high places all across Judah to ensure the rain? Who? Baal. They had been in, under every green tree worshiping Baal. 
And the thing about uh, can, the sh- can the heavens grant showers? They had become not only caught up in the worship of the fertility gods of Canaan, but they had become enamored and engrossed with the astral deities of Mesopotamia. And they had begun to worship the stars and the planets and the fertility god. In the end, Jeremiah comes back and says, but it's not Baal that gives the rain and the heavens can't cause the rain. It's only you, God. And you know, in the end, I, I know these people did not understand what was happening. Uh, they, just, they just were overwhelmed by this. But you know what they said, bottom line, when they got their heart right and their attitude right, they said, God, you are God. We'll trust in you, even if you beat us. And that's not half bad faith. Though he slay me, yet will I serve him. Friends, if we're dealing with God, and there's only one, whatever happens, there's no place else to go. Questions or comments? Yes, Winston? I think God would have reversed things. I don't think it's any nation in the world could have took Jerusalem if God hadn't allowed it, of course. But the trick is, I think that what you're saying is the attitude that we have toward God is the crucial thing in our relationship, you know? And these were His children. Uh, I expect to see them in heaven. But boy, they had come, become polluted, you know? And the thing was, they had lost that priority commitment. Yeah. I forgot where I heard this. Somebody said, if you're not willing to do nothing for God, you're not willing to do anything. What he was talking about, you've got to be willing to sit still before you're ready to run. You know, because really, it's not the sitting or the running that's important. It's that we're in the will of God, you know. I can't imagine a cultural example as, um, as decisive as the exile that could possibly convey to us the meaning that they went through. I really, I really can't imagine. I guess if every Bible was taken from us, or, you know, <laughs> and we were sent off to outer Mongolia with our families to live the rest of our days, somehow we might catch something of what happened. But, um, well, this was traumatic. This is where the Jews begin to say, well... I guess we don't have to have the temple to be right with God. Well, I guess God will fulfill His promises someday in His own way. This is where the reorientation of theological truths had to occur for Judaism. That's why there's no big... The Jews are not uptight about not having a lamb to sacrifice anymore. Because in theology, their theology had to deal with this and it made prayer the place of sacrifice. Lord God, I pray that 
we'll never have to go this far to see life the way you want us to see it. Lord, I guess the thing that comes home to me more and more is that you have, in your wisdom and providence, given me some things to be responsible for. And, oh God, I, I, like, I like to talk about your free grace. But I get very nervous talking about responsibilities because I often don't do the things that I know that you would have me to do. I thank you for free, free, no-strings-attached grace. But Lord, help me to know that my life and the joys and circumstances are somewhat determined by my response to you day by day. Lord, I don't think I can imagine how much it must have hurt these people and caused them to wonder about you. But I pray, God, that if, if and when disaster may come in our lives, that we might have that faith that is not determined by circumstance, that knows that the greatest gift you get is knowing you. God, forgive us for making so many things, gods and priorities. And help us, we pray, to put the priority emphasis on knowing you. Thank you for loving us the way we are, but help us to be more than we can be for you. In Jesus' name, amen.